So um, this ad is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Good morning, this is Robin Norgren and I'm your host for Creativity Montessori and the Meaning of Life. I'd like to begin with a poem by Mary Oliver called, How Would You Live Then? What if a hundred rose-breasted grosbeaks flew in circles around your head? What if the mockingbird came into your house with you? and became your advisor? What if the bees filled your walls with honey and all you needed to do was ask them and they would fill the bowl? What if the brook slid downhill just past your bedroom window so you could listen to its slow prayers as you fell asleep? What if the stars began to shout their names or to run this way and that way above the clouds? What if you painted a picture of a tree and the leaves began to rustle and a bird cheerfully sang from its painted branches? What if you suddenly saw that the silver of water was brighter than the silver of money? What if you finally saw that the sunflowers turning toward the sun all day and every day, who knows how, but they do it, were more precious, more meaningful than gold. Here's some thoughts from a book called Walking on Water by Madeline Lango, the author of A Wrinkle in Time. And she's talking about labels and names. Remembering the lovely things we have forgotten is one of the reasons for all art. Shirley Rousseau knew that when he painted the jungles and Marlowe having Satan cry out, why, this is hell, nor am I out of it. Thinkest thou that I, who saw the face of God and tasted the eternal joys of heaven, am not tormented with ten thousand hells in being deprived of everlasting bliss? He must have known hell himself, for we know the terrible things as well as the beautiful. Bach setting down the soprano and the alto duet in the 78th cantata knew such heavenly joy that it is shared by all who hear the music. In the act of creation, our logical, prove-it-to-me minds relax. We begin to understand anew all that we understood as children. When we saw we folk under the leaves or walk down the stairs without touching... But this understanding is, or should be, greater than the child's, because we understand in the light of all that we have learned and experienced in growing up. George Eliot says, If we had seen a keen vision of all ordinary life, it would be like hearing the grass grow or the squirrel's heartbeat and we should die of the roar which lies on the other side of silence. As it is, the quickest of us walk about well wadded with stupidity. Despite this wadding, the artist in the moment of creation does hear the tiny beating of the squirrel heart and does indeed die to self on the other side of silence. 
where he retains the vision which includes angels and dragons and unicorns. The great artists never lose this quality, which the world would limit to children. And along with this wadding with stupidity comes the denigration of children's books and writers of children's books. A year or so before she invited me to come to the conference at Ayab Napa, Dr. Marion Van Horn asked me to give a talk on Christian children's books. A large part of my job was to give a definition of what, in fact, makes a Christian children's book. Such a definition would seem to be a simple task, but it is not. It used to be answered the easy way. How many times is Jesus mentioned? But that doesn't work. Jesus may be mentioned on every page in a book that is for neither children nor Christians. It perturbs me to observe in how many contemporary novels, O Christ or Jesus, are spattered over the pages side by side with four-letter words. So the use of the name Jesus is no criterion. And the fact that Christian stories are still story further complicates things. For story touches on the realm of art, and art itself is looked on as something unfit for the real world. There's a New Yorker cartoon that shows a woman opening the door of her house to a friend. We look through the door, and in the back of the house, a man is writing at the typewriter with a large manuscript piled on the desk beside him. The friend asks, Has your husband found a job yet, or is he still writing? A successful businesswoman had the temerity to ask me about my royalties, just at the time when my books were at last making reasonable earnings. When told, she was duly impressed and remarked, And to think, most people would have had to work hard for that. I choked over my tea, not wanting to laugh in her face. A young friend of mine was asked what she did, and when she replied that she was a poet, the inquirer responded amused, Oh, I didn't mean your hobby. So it's not only the church that fobs off art as untrue or unreal, and art for children as the most looked down on of all. Daniel Laporte says in her book, White Hot Truth, Being exposed to conflicting dogmas is one of the best things that can happen to you. Like Nietzsche said, one must still have chaos within oneself to give birth to a dancing star. Confusion always leads to clarity, and from there you make your art in the world. We fall for some lies to get down to our truth. All the falsifiers throughout the centuries, from the crusaders to charlatans, were just playing their roles in the unfolding of the bigger truth. Some thought they had no choice but to pass down fabrications in order to earn the good favor of their deities. They wanted the riches of paradise that their gods promised in the afterlife. Some were true seekers wrestling with the big questions and earnestly trying to dispel the darkness with love and light. Others were trying on deception and power-mongering for a karmic fic. Hey, I know, let's start an inquisition. As humans, we're slightly, we've slightly increased our civility when it comes to how we defend and promote our beliefs, but just slightly. We've yet to make the great strides of consciousness in our various departments of truth. We continue to slaughter and exile huge populations from our homelands over fundamentalist beliefs. Scores of us still follow religions that preach extreme intolerance. We kill for our gods. We bully non-believers. We wage war for what we believe to be true. Many of us living relatively or blatantly privileged lives have created our own nouveau religion, materialism. It's as pervasive as any of the major world religions. And we fight and kill and steal and pillage and lie for our right to profit and consume. 
same shit, different deity, the deity of the dollar or the yen or the euro. Our mass consumption has become a weapon of mass destruction, fashioned from lies about so-called success and happiness. These lies take a damaging toll on our self-esteem, and we keep trying to inflate our worth with more stuff, more attention, more stimulation. In the cult of materialism, reverence for simplicity and basic consideration is a courageous act. A lie only has power when someone believes it. You need a congregation to have a church, fighters for an army, voters to get elected. You need buyers for wholesale lies. Lie spreading requires widespread participation. It's not only that they, the government or organized religions or the media or the educators, are cranking out non-truths. It's that all of us are paying, by choice, for a variety of deceptions with our money, time, and attention. We need to take individual responsibility for the beliefs that animate our lives. We need to acknowledge the ideas that are driving our choices. So why do we choose certain beliefs over others, especially when some beliefs are so damaging? Because they give us comfort and certain truths are very uncomfortable. We crave the comfort of connection. We want that almost indefinable pleasure and ease that comes from feeling connected. We are psychologically and physiologically designed to be in community, and we believe and do preposterous things to feel attached, accepted, and approved of, especially if we can get the approval of a crowd Essentially, we go along with lies so we can prove points from a perceived higher power. And too many of us think that other people's opinions are a higher power. We stoop and shrink to give more space to outside input. We become cautious and accommodating. We choose to believe that we are less powerful so someone else can feel important when they approve of and love us but at least we get the love we crave, not that it's real love, if there ever was a vicious cycle. If you think you're defective or in need of fixing, which is the biggest lie of all, you will most definitely attract lovers, teachers, preachers, politicians, who want to so-called love you, fix you, and lead you. It's an economy of broken hearts and menders, Too many questions or too much self-sufficiency throws the salvation business out of balance. Emancipation and breakups would erupt. Advertisers would go bankrupt. Gods would topple. It would be a self-reliance anarchy. So I'm asking you, do your beliefs take your personal power into account? Do your beliefs fuel your freedom? Do you believe in yourself?